All right. Good morning, Mike, and uh, happy middle of August. Man, the summer is just yeah. galloping past, I guess, is the, the, <laughs> the part of the, the artwork behind you. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, right. Galloping past. See, uh, it always seems like mid-August, you're like, wait a minute, we're kind of planning on the end of the year and maybe mid-winters already. It's crazy. But you've got Lake Garda and the Sunfish, some big sunfish event, and uh, I'm sure that'll be a lot of fun. But before we get to that, and this might actually help you, I guess, when you get to Garda, I want to talk about the second lap or, you know, on this, <clears throat> we do a lot of, you know, when we're lured twice around and, you know, I think we we plan out the first beat quite well, but sometimes uh, as we round the lure mark on the second lap, um, we don't have the same confidence or uh, we're a little more reactionary, I guess, on the second beat. So hoping you can get me through this crisis of uh, round the lure mark and not knowing what to do. Right. We can do that. Yeah. Good. Speaking, not speaking for myself, but maybe for some others. <laughs> I, have, I have a friend that has trouble with second right, beat. Right. Yes. Yeah. I've heard. So, uh, <laughs> So yeah, so I mean, essentially, right, the second beat is um, is almost like a chance to restart somewhat, but with actually you have a lot more history and knowledge having done a lap. Um, so walk me through how to kind of formulate a second strategy for the second beat. Yeah, I think the the the, the first answer to that is how to do that is to just to make start making that plan before you even start the race. So when I'm making my pre race strategy. And I'm saying, hey, I want to go right on this beat because there's land over there. You know, like the second beat's probably going to be the same because the land is still there unless something changes or I expect to change. Or, uh, you know, if it's going to play oscillations up the middle, that's probably going to be my strategy on the second beat too. So the first answer is the plan before the race. Say, okay, for the second beat, I might, you know, this is our, our right now, if I had to sail the second beat, this is what I would do. The second answer to that is you got to reassess as you're going down the run. And there's kind of a right moment to do that. Like you're not going to do that right as soon as you're on the weather mark. Uh, you're caught in your own little battles. You know, you're trying to get an overlap, ride somebody's wave. You're got to surf, surf. It's hard to go fast, clear your air. You know, there's a lot going on. So I always think that upwind and downwind, about 80% of the way to the next mark is the right time. So it's late enough in the leg that, you know, things are not going to change a lot, you know, it's established and fresh and, uh, but it's early enough that you can still do something about it. If you do it at 90%, you're likely to be like, you got an overlap. No, you don't, you know, one of those things. And you're not even thinking about it anymore. You got to do it at that last moment before you get the, you know, that you can have free, the last moment you have time to think. So you got to take a pause. So if you're single-handed, obviously that's uh, something you got to do in your head. You have the conversation with yourself. You might say it aloud uh, so that everybody hears it. Uh, but, you know, if you're on a team boat, J24 or something like that, do you also take that chance to kind of paint the picture for everybody um, so they kind of know the general plan getting around the corner? Sure. The more hands you have on the boat, the more you can delineate the, you know, when I'm sailing a single-handed boat, it's me. And I, I literally talk to myself. It's, it's a little embarrassing sometimes, you know, like, Mike, you got to go left on this. Remember it worked last time. And, uh, but if you're the tactician, this is, you know, you got other, you're, you're thinking about lots of things and you have the chance to pause a lot. Uh, so maybe you're thinking about it, but 80% is your time to articulate it and make your final decision. Maybe you've been sort of collecting information on the run. Maybe you think about it a little bit but there's kind of a hard stop at 80%. All right, I got to make a decision. Okay, guys, we're going to round the right turn, around the right gate. We're going to go hard left. You know, at all costs, something like that, you know. Okay. Um, we, we spend a lot of time, you know, ahead of the race, figuring out the breeze pattern. How do you do that while you're going downwind to make sure that when you come out of the mark, you're, you're going, you're sort of in phase and going to the, going to the first shift? You know, I, I find, you know, like if I'm, if I'm making that decision upwind and I want to decide which, which is the lifted, the headed jive, you want to be on a header downwind, you know, I find that that's a lot easier upwind. You got the compass. If I'm, you know, if it's five degree oscillations, if I'm up five, you know, maybe that's the time to jive. And I can see that from the compass and I can make that decision. 
I think downwind it's a little harder. You know, you're you're changing angles a lot more, a little bit of pressure, maybe you can go a lot deeper. I don't really use the compass for shifts downwind. I, I have a much more visual of my angle to the mark, really. So let's just take the example where it's an oscillating day. You're going to play the, you know, 10 degree shifts up the middle. I got a 10 degree righty at the weather mark. I jibe. I'm in face. I'm on the headed tack downwind. And as I'm going downwind, you know, it's sometime in the run. If I get a big old lift, I'm not, you know, if I'm probably not heading at the mark anymore. And I really feel in my trimmer, you know, if I'm a multi-handed boat, like, Hey, you got to come up a lot, you know? And so <clears throat> that tells me I'm on a lift and I don't want to be on a lift downwind. I jibe. So I keep track downwind and you got to keep track anyway, because you need to do that tactically. So you better have that in your head, whether you're a tactician for yourself in a single handed boat, or that's your sole job. You, you have to know what shift you're on anyway. So you better be, when you get to that 80% point, you're not, you shouldn't be saying, what shift am I on? You already know, because <laughs> you better know, because otherwise you're not doing well on your run. So the other thing about downwind versus upwind is those shifts comes much slower because you're not sailing through them. Upwind, you, you kind of have you know, shifts coming down, you get to it, you attack, and next one comes. So if they're coming every five minutes upwind and it's a 15-minute beat, you get three of them. If it's um, downwind, first of all, you're probably going faster. It's probably only a 10-minute run, but you're going with the shifts. You might only get one of these on the run. So it's not as hard to keep track of, I think. But bottom line is you got to keep track anyway. Same goes with puffs, right? Like you're sort of connecting puffs downwind. You better sort of have some feel, at least where the local puffs are, before you get to that 80%. And then once you get to 80%, that's your chance to say, okay, I'm playing these local puffs. I got to look beyond that now. What's going on in the edges of the courses? That's what I, one of the questions I ask myself. How's the right look? How's the left look? You know, has anything changed? What phase am I in here? Just to sort of just mentally know which way you are. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And so as, as you come into the pileup, um, <laughs> <laughs> presuming that you're in the pileup, um, you know, what's, what's sort of like in that moment, how do you just make prioritize, I guess, that plan, you know, in terms of, A, you got to get out clean. Uh, what's more important, pressure, shift, fleet management? You know, is there in that critical moment, is there one thing that's more important than the other? Yeah. So, you know, that the, the, the short answer to that is it depends, right? Like it's, it, what is the priority of the day? Is it to get right, to get out of current and you're in Charleston and you have to do it? You know, nothing else matters or, you know, is the right maybe favored? We expect a long-term shift, but you're not in any hurry to get there. So I think the answer is, you know, how compelling, if you decide you wanted to go right, how compelling is it to get there? Can I round the other gate, go a minute and tack and go right that way? Is that just fine? Because I got nice big clean lanes then? Or do I'm, am I willing to round and sit in dirt if I have to, to get out of that current or something? So I have to know that, that's part of my decision at the 80% on the run is I'm saying, okay, I got to go right, but how badly do I have to go right? Because one of my favorite things, if it's a gate, is to round the quote unquote wrong gate, wait for a nice lane and tack, and I'm not all jammed up having to tack twice or sit in dirt and waves and stuff. I got to go do that. You mentioned gates versus a single mark. How yeah. does that change things? Um... Yeah, so... I, that's another thing about the magic about the 80%. You know, at some point where you're going down a, a, a run, if there's a gate, you know, if there's just one mark, you're all lining up for the same thing. So you're deciding, you know, at what point am I going to try to fight for the inside or let some other guys fight for it? And maybe I can break free and break the overlap, you know, and that depends on lots of things, you know, whether you can break free and, you know, or if there's a nice gap, you can head up and maybe kind of establish an overlap or something. Uh, with the gate, you got a choice. And, you know, it, it's always got to start with the strategy. And if it's absolutely compelling to go right, you're going to have to round the left gate looking down turn. We always say left gate, left turn. And, um, and you're just going to have to suck it up. So you're going to round tight. You're thinking about that. Try to stay high so you can hold your lane longer. And... Um, but I think that 80% time is the last chance you have to cross through the gate if that's what you want to do. 
And then you have to start thinking about weighing which way you want to go, what's your strategy with all the factors that go into games, which are, which one's less crowded. You know, if it's a really big fleet, I'm going to be at the Garda Worlds there. There'll be a hundred boats. So, you know, people are pretty fast. Everybody qualified to be there. So there's no stragglers. You know, they're going to be crowded. So at some point I'm going to be like, I just got to go around the right gate because there's 30 boats at the left one, <laughs> you know, and there's only 15 at the right one. Um, you know, the other factors are which one's further upwind, uh, which way do I want to go? Uh, the other factor for the gates, I think, is, you know, sometimes downwind traffic. Like, if if the whole fleet is, like, overstood here on, you know, on the right side of the course, then the left gate, when you exit, there's going to be a whole bunch of spinnakers over you. And if you look up on the other side, and there's nobody going downwind on that side of the course, then that's freer. So you got to weigh all these things and make a decision on which gate. So it's an extra burden. <laughs> And then sometimes it's really hard to cross over to the other one. You get kind of augured in in your group. You got some overlaps. Like, how do you get there if you really want to? And uh, so that becomes the next problem. But 80% is your last chance to cross. Jive, take a couple of sterns, duck a few people, and then reestablish yourself at the other gate. Hmm. I'm going to take it up. Uh, you, you brought up an interesting point. I know you love to sketch um, <laughs> on the things, but... Um, Go back to that fleet, the fleet traffic thing. You know, people, I, I, you know, in in asymmetric boats, people tend to come in from the sides. Mm -hmm. Metrics, the you know, the the middle is busier. But um, what can you explain about wind shadows? I mean, there might be that temptation to, let's say you're, you know, you're with a group and you don't want to fall them out to the right. You know, the first reaction is, well, let's just tack around the, you know, assume we're going left gate, left turn, tack around the mark. But all of a sudden, you find yourself in the middle of the course, which is not the yeah. best place to be most of the time, right? So where are the wind shadows with both symmetric and asymmetric boats? Yeah, I mean, th we could spend a whole day on this one, but yeah. like, you know, suppose, um, you know, suppose here's your boat and your sail. Let's just draw something here. If you're like this and, you know, go down here, spinnaker or not, you know, maybe you got your spinnaker. You know, if you're the boat in front, you know, it's really wherever that your apparent wind is. So, you know, if I'm here, right, and the wind is, you know, over here, really I'm looking at my masthead fly. So my masthead fly is clear of this boat, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if instead I'm here and the wind's here, you know, I'm not fine. And it's pretty interesting how quickly I can clear my wind with apparent wind. So if I head up, you know, I'm really haven't moved much, right? But because I've just headed up, my apparent wind moves forward. So I pretty instantly can get clear. So my massive fly will do that mm -hmm. and as long as it's pointed outside. Um, so that's any, any one individual boat, but that works for clumps too. You know, if there's 10 boats behind you, kind of all in a spot and you're directly, if your basset fly is pointing at them, you're in trouble. So I'll do a, a big head up or bear off, either one's valid or a jibe, get my air clear. And boy, as you funnel into that lured mark and gate, boy, can that wind shadow be awful. Mm. So when, when I, let's say I want to tack, um, what's, what's worse? Because sort of the edges, um, you know, because let's say on an asymmetric, they're coming in on jives from opposite sides and you're going around. You're sort of, it's almost like being at the weather mark. You're, you're kind of behind or below the parade. Um, so is the middle better in asymmetric fleets? Yeah. So that's a really great question. So, you know, let's just take a gate here, right? So you're coming down wind and you, know, you got your, you got your wind coming straight down the course, right? So what's happening, what you're talking about is what's happening is all these boats are, you know, we'll make everybody on starboard green. Like, you know, if these are boats, right? They're all reaching in essentially from the edges of the course. And they want to do this left turn. And then on the other side, there's a whole bunch of port tackers coming in, right? Mm -hmm. 
So it's pretty different. They're going to do, you know, likely they're going to do a, a jive round. You know, each one's going to do a jive rounding unless they cross the course. But you're right, that kind of opens up the course. And if you're a, a symmetric shoot, you know, it's going to be pretty different. All these boats are going to be here, right? Kind of coming in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what I do is that there is a final decision here. You know, at 80%, you're kind of making your big call. Which way do I want to go? And then you got to make a last second call. Like you round in all these boats. If you did this, you know, left turn here, right? Left gate, left turn, you head up, right? <clears throat> and all these shadows are here. Are you better just immediately, you know, finding a hole and just tacking into the middle? Yeah, quite, quite possibly. Mm. I think that just develops so late and, you know, that you, that isn't an 80% decision. That's sort of a 95% decision or even after you round, mm. you're like, Ooh, this isn't good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this that that brings us, I guess, to the next point is look, how does this strategy and the tactics change when you're uh, at the front of the fleet versus um, kind of buried in the middle? Yeah. So, you know, the, when you're in the front of the fleet, you're you're kind of worried about the boats behind you. So all these wind shadow questions you're just asking, and then the exit, right? Like, um, you know, whether it's an asymmetric and they're coming in from a side or not, sometimes even with symmetrics, all these boats are coming in from one side, right? Like for some reason, they're all stacked up over here. And if you round this gate, you're gonna be underneath it all. So if you're, if you're starboard and you do this, you right turn, and this one's pretty free. So you might choose to go here instead. And even if you wanna go left, you tack, you're not in bad shape. Um, you know, I think it, for the front of the fleet, the more you're worried about the boats behind and what they're doing to you. And as you get to the middle and the back, you know, it thins out behind you and you're less worried about that. And you're more worried about, okay, how am I going to, what am I going to do with the boats in front of me after I round? You know, so I think that changes that. And I also think that, you know, there's sort of thin at the very front and then it gets super dense. You get the hundred boat worlds coming up you know, the top 10 are going to have a much easier time than 11 through 50. And then it might spread out a little more again. So, but that, that's a good back to your 80%, you know, that's the sort of chance to look back behind you and make that part of the plan of, of what is the, the cleaner best exit in terms of where the traffic is. Yeah. yeah. It's really a list of questions at that 80%. Mm. What was my initial strategy? what might have changed and and to find out what might have changed maybe you know the first beat wasn't what i thought it was i thought we should go right the left killed me all right my strategy was wrong right so i'm going to reassess uh what might have changed even since i rounded is there some new indicator a line of clouds or whoa huge shift coming something something's very different now i got to reassess so those are all the things and traffic behind and then you're looking ahead for the gate, which gates favored and, you know, which gates may be less crowded and, you know, what's my exit going to be like? So those are kind of the, and, and then, you know, then there's the moment you're in, which is the shifts. So there's a lot to think about. Yeah. And you also mentioned maybe the time of day. We see it here in Newport a lot where maybe particularly offshore, you know, sort of the first be the day, maybe the left corner pays, but you know, as the day goes on, second beat, that left corner is not the same. So you can certainly be tricked into being like, well, hey, the leaders, you know, made the left corner, but um, not reversing your plan or, or uh, you know, following old news. Correct. The um, things change. So, and sometimes it's just the time of day and you know it. You know, as a sea breeze fills, it does one thing. Once it's there, it's another. As it wanes at the end of the day, it does something else. So um, you might know that pattern. And mm-hmm. then other days, it's kind of spooking you. You you know something changed. You don't know why. <laughs> but, you know, you are looking for some sort of, you know, U.S. sailing team weather gurus who are always like, give us an indicator of a change. I, you know. Mm-hmm say it's going to go 10 degrees right today, when and how, you know, it doesn't do me any good to know it's going to go 10 degrees and then sometime in the next six hours. 
but you know, tell me, is that with a line of clouds or, you know, is that with the thermal ending or the, you know, fill in the blank. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for. It's like, you're doing that last stand up before the start. You're like, okay, guys, we wanted to go right. What do we all see? That's what the 80% downwind is. Cool. What else is going on here? All right. So I guess the final question, in your experience, even as a, as a coach, I mean, where do you see um, this, what typically goes wrong here? And then how do we prevent that from happening? You know, as people sort of round the mark blind. I think the biggest flaw that most people do is they, they really get, they get, they stay in the moment. It's really easy to do. You're, you're fighting for that, catch that last wave, break the overlap to do whatever you want to do. And it's, if you don't, you, you need to pause and, you know, put something on autopilot, make sure you're, you know, if I'm by myself, maybe I'll go a little extra high, get myself really clear of my air, wait for the next wave, lock my tiller down, and then just turn around and look for a little bit. Mm-hmm. So maybe I'm not hundred percent speed while I do it, but I'm 95% speed and, and you know, I'm, I have to take that moment to really, to look. I think that's the biggest thing is people don't pause, you know, near, right before the mess at the leeward mark to go make a, a good decision and uh, get, you know, put destiny in your own hands instead of just waiting until you're fighting for whatever. That's what happens. You're fighting for your position. <laughs>